Now let me ask you this. Do you ever talk to yourself? In our society, people kind of look down on that. And um, they see it as a sign that, that you might be um, out of your mind. You know, that there's a uh, screw loose. You're off your rocker. You're not playing with a full deck. Yeah, all those expressions that, that talk about that. Uh, but, you know, everybody talks to themselves. It's just a matter of whether or not they do it out loud or not, right? Uh, so the real question is not whether or not you talk uh, to yourself. The real question is what do you talk to yourself about? Do you, uh, do you criticize yourself? Do you talk to yourself about how, how good everyone else has it? You know, it's easy to do that. Or maybe you're the other kind of person. Maybe you, you compliment yourself. And you think about how bad everyone else is. You criticize everyone else. I mean, even if you don't say it out loud, we all still know what you're thinking, right? It comes out in other ways. Uh, so which is better? Self-criticizing or self-complimenting? Some people might say there's, you just need to be balanced. Um, a balance of the negative and positive, and there's, there's probably something to that. But you know, either way, the real problem is that both ways of thinking, we're always thinking about ourselves. We're self-absorbed. We place ourselves at, at the center of the universe. We make ourselves into an object of, of worship, really. We, we usurp the place of God in our lives. That's what happens. So, uh, as we continue our study this morning of what God is like, we're going to be looking to Psalm 103. And in Psalm 103, David shows us how to talk to ourselves. Not about ourselves, but about God. So turn there with me, Psalm 103. The superscript of Psalm 103 says it's a psalm of David like many of the Psalms. And you remember David's story, right? That he was the, the shepherd boy anointed by God to become king. He was the one then who, who was courageous uh, when the Israelites were threatened by the Philistines and the giant Goliath. And David stepped forward and killed the giant with his slingshot. He became a successful warrior, so successful that King Saul, the king at the time, grew jealous of David and sought to have him killed, sought to murder him. So David is someone who knew what it was like to face anxiety, to face worry, to deal with trouble. And David, then later on, of course, after Saul dies, David becomes king. And his troubles only get more complex, more difficult. So how did he keep going? How did he deal with all of that? He talked to himself. That's what we find in Psalm 103. So take a look at the opening verses of Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2. David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. See, he's, he's speaking to himself. He's telling himself to praise God. He's trying to, I think he's shaking himself out of being selfishly absorbed. That's really what he's getting at here. He, he, he says, it's like he's telling to himself, self, soul, you need to be worshiping God, not thinking about these other things. So break out of it. And that's really the focus of the rest of this psalm. It's, I think of it this way. Psalm 103 gives us 14 thoughts to tell ourselves about God and his love for us. So 14. I mean, that's, you're not supposed to do that when you teach the Bible, when you preach. That's, that's, you know, you're only supposed to have three points. Um, but I found 14 in the Psalms, so that's what we're getting. So um, we should be out of here by 3, 4 o'clock today. <laughs> no. No, we'll go through it quickly. We'll walk through the Psalm. And, and the, I think the intent of it is we are supposed to be overwhelmed. We're supposed to be flooded with this sense of God's love. So that it pushes out those, that, uh, that, that uh, obsession we have with ourselves. That it pushes it aside. So let's take a look. Uh, we'll walk our way through the psalm. The first thought is, is for us to think about God's forgiveness. Uh, take a look at, at verse 3. 
He, David speaks of God as the one who pardons all your iniquities. He pardons all our iniquities. It gives us a, a legal kind of picture, right? A courtroom picture, a pardon. We can't understand the love of God unless we understand His justice. That He is the ultimate judge. That we deserve His condemnation for our sins. And yet the love of God is expressed and that He provides a way for us to be pardoned through Jesus Christ. For us to be forgiven. Right? That's, that's the love of God. Next, think about healing. Look at the second line there in verse 3. It says, who heals all your diseases. Now, some commentators in, in talking about this verse try to say that, that David's talking about specific plagues that, that God would bring upon people to punish their sin. And if you know the story of King David, there was a time when that happened during his reign. Because of David's sin in, in numbering the people, in, in, in trying to assess his strength and his power, God brought a plague upon the people. But you know, the, the verse itself isn't quite that specific. And so what it, it reminds me of, I mean, we go through life now and sometimes we find healing and sometimes we don't. But ultimately, we know that the reality of heaven, the reality of that future salvation is that there will be complete healing. That God will take away sickness and death. That He will conquer it and remove it from our existence for eternity. And so a part of, of I think that's an expression of God's love. As we've talked about a couple of times over these past few weeks, God didn't design life to be full of suffering and, and sin and sickness. That's not the way He wanted it to be. And so in His love, He heals. Thirdly, Think about redemption. Redemption. Look at verse 4. The first line in verse 4 says, Who redeems your life from the pit. Redemption is, 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 is often used in a financial sense. Particularly in that day and age, when someone would go to, to purchase a slave. And, and that fits in with the, the wording here. Someone who's locked away in a pit. Right? A slave or a, perhaps a prisoner who needs to be rescued. And someone comes to pay. That's what God does. Right? He redeems us. He, he pays the price for our sins through Jesus Christ. That is, is God's redemption. Next, think about adoption. Adoption. Look at, at the second part of verse 4 there. It says, Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Those are great words, loving kindness and compassion. They speak of a relationship. And loving kindness is used several times repeatedly throughout the psalm. So that's why I say that the, the overarching theme is love. And specifically, this loving kindness is, is the idea of being faithful to a committed relationship, a covenant relationship. To be brought into that kind of relationship with God so that it's, it says here, He crowns you with loving kindness. The only way I think that can happen, you know, in a sense, it's like being adopted into the royal family. That's the picture it gives us with that idea of crowning. You're brought into a relationship with God. You're brought into His family, even though we're outsiders. You're adopted. You're crowned with that loving kindness. Fifth, think about goodness. Think about God's goodness. That's part of his love, his, his overall desire to, be, to bless us, to give us what is good. Look at verse 5. It says, Who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. You know, every good thing that you experience in life is a gift from God. We're told that in the book of James. James chapter 1, verse 17. And that there's everything, everything good is from Him. And so we should acknowledge that and see that. You know, when we enjoy a meal, we don't pray because we have to, because there's some rule that says that. You know, I pray before a meal because I'm thankful that, that God's provided. 
He's giving us something good. Everything in life, relationships, uh, exercise. If you enjoy exercise, you enjoy being out in nature, anything, that you, anything that's good, your family. Every good moment is from him. So acknowledge that. See that as an expression of his love. Let those thoughts fill your mind. And there at the end of the verse, it says, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Well, that's an interesting statement. Isaiah uses a similar picture over in Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, and, and, you know, you think your youth being renewed. I mean, there could be a sense there where he's just saying that uh, to speak of, of having energy and vitality. But, I mean, there's a sense if we understand the reality of eternal life from the pages of Scripture, that we truly will be renewed. We will soar like, like an eagle in that sense. We will have that strength come back to us. It's part of God's goodness that He wants to bless us. He wants us to have that life. The sixth thought to think about is justice. Justice. Verse 6 says, The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. That's a comforting thought, isn't it? You look out at the world and you see the injustice and to know that, that God will not allow that to go on. That God will intervene at some point. That God will fix that. That he is a just God. That's an expression of his love. To know that, that he does what is best, what is right. The seventh thought is to think about God's revelation of himself. Look at verses uh, 7 and 8 here in Psalm 103. It says, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Those words there in verse 8 come from Exodus 34. It was the way that God revealed himself to Moses when Moses saw God's glory. He used those words. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And so part of God's love, think about this, part of his love is that he lets us know him. He reveals himself to us. I mean, isn't that a part of a relationship? When, when you love someone, you let them know who you are. You know them and they know you. That's, that's the relationship. And so when we look at, at the scripture, that's, that's why some people, I think, refer to the scripture as a love letter from God. It is that, in a sense. He's showing us what he's like. He's revealing himself. He's done that through history, through the prophets, and, and particularly in the person of Jesus Christ. That we see what God is like so that we can know him and have a relationship with him. God's revelation is an act of his love. Next, number eight, think about patience. And patience may not, I struggled to find the right word to sum up this verse. Look at verse nine. It says, he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Right? There, is, there is that reality that sin provokes God to anger. But what it says here is that that doesn't last. It's, it's like an hourglass. The sands run out. The time expires in a sense. You know, God is always just. But he's not someone who holds a grudge. He's not someone who is bitter. And that's, again, an expression of his love. He cares for us. Next, number nine, think about mercy. Uh, look at verse 10. It says, he has not dealt with us according to our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. I think about sin in a sense as, as like a credit card, right? Every time you sin, it's like swiping the card again. You run up another charge. And there's that sense that that should become a hindrance, that should block your relationship with God. But part of his, the incredible salvation that he gives and in his love 
is that he doesn't deal with us according to those sins. He doesn't treat us as the debtors that we are. He doesn't punish us for those sins as we deserve when we trust in Christ. When we enter into that relationship with him, we, we are forgiven. That's his mercy. Right? Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we really deserve. That's what this verse talks about. Think about his mercy. Next, uh, the tenth thought. Think about God's faithfulness. It says there in verse 11, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. You ever done that where at night you, you look out at the stars on a good clear night? It was that way last night. And you get that, if, if, you, if you wait and take the time to stay there long enough, you begin to really get a sense of the distance of how deep and, and space is as we look out. And it, that's kind of what David's drawing on here. He says, look, the, the loving kindness of God, that covenant faithfulness of his, is so great, it's so big, that it can only be compared to the distance from the heavens to the earth. And even that doesn't do it. Right? It's that idea that it's, it's this infinite faithfulness. It never ends. God is always faithful. You can always trust him. You can always rely upon him. He's true to his word. It's his love that he's that faithful. The eleventh thought. Think about God's protection. Look at verse 12. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now you get the sense of the picture here, right? You look out at the sunset in one direction and you, and you look back the other. It's like as far as you can see either way, right? It's, 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 it has this sense of an infinite distance between the two, east and west. And so here David's saying, God separates your transgressions, your sins. He takes them away and he, he separates them from you as far as they could possibly get. And so there's this sense of protection in that. Right? The idea is he separates you from the, from the consequences of sin, from the punishment that we deserve. We're completely protected, insulated from that through Christ. And one day, when we stand in glory with him, we'll be removed from sin's presence just as far. We can't even fathom what life would be like to have no sin around, to have no temptation. And yet, that's what God does. He wants to protect us. He wants to, to, to remove that transgression as far away from us as it could possibly be. He protects us. Twelfth thought here. Think about compassion. Look at verses 13 and 14. It says, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. We talked about that a few weeks ago when we looked at Psalm 90, right? The reality that God created man from the dust of the earth. And so as God relates to us, he knows us. We talk about knowing him here, but he knows us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our frailties. He knows what we're made of, literally. And so God has compassion for us. He's like a good father that knows his children. He knows what they can handle. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, where it talks about God not allowing us to be tempted beyond what we are able. He's compassionate. He knows. He knows what we can, what we can handle. He's, he cares for us. It's part of his love for us. A 13th thought here. Think about security. Verse 15. It says, as for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over, it, it is no more. And its place acknowledges it no longer. 
But the loving kindness of the Lord, there's that word again, is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. Right, the idea gives us this picture of wildflowers in a field and, and then in, 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 in a hot day when under the hot sun, those can be, can be dried out, burnt to a crisp and the wind comes along and they just crumble and blow away. But it, it, it makes this contrast. A relationship with God is not like that. It's eternal. It's secure. It's, it's reliable. It's steady. And it, he, he even makes that point here to say it's uh, the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. Right? There's this sense of succeeding generations that if they're willing to trust God and to believe in him, that they come under that security, that protection. That's the character of God. That's his love expressed. And then it, it concludes this last thought, thinking about God's power. Look at verse 19. It says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. And so just as the psalm began with, bless the Lord, O my soul, look at how it ends. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Right? God's power is so great. And this reminds us of this, these concluding verses. He rules over all. Nothing resists his power. And that's another indication of, of his love, that his love is unstoppable. Nothing stands in the way of it. Nothing can prevent it. No angelic force, not even Satan himself, can oppose the love of God. He rules over all things. That's his power. And so David even calls angels to worship. And he says, see what God is like? And so he, he makes this transition, right? As I, as I envision it. From being caught up in thinking about himself to being so caught up in thinking about God that by the end of the psalm, he's telling the angels to worship him. Now, isn't that what needs to happen in our lives on a daily basis? to somehow move beyond all the, the self-absorbed kinds of thoughts and to think about God. Because that's what gives us perspective that enables us to go through life and really walk with God. That's when these, these characteristics of God that we've been talking about all summer, His, His attributes, become practical and real when, when they compel us to to be caught up in worshiping Him. And yeah, things come along, they, they pull our thoughts away, and we have to fight to turn our heart back to Him. That's what this psalm is, is all about. So, what's, what's your response today as we think about this psalm? Maybe the, the place to begin is, is to think about fearing God. Did you notice that in the psalm that it talked about, it used that expression several times? There it, it said, it, even back up in verse, um, verse 17, the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, everlasting on those who fear Him. Right? That's a way, a fundamental idea of how we relate to God. Not fear in terror, we've just talked about His love and His salvation. But fear in the sense of understanding who God is, knowing Him in His power, respecting Him, real, fear, do, fearing His judgment, but taking comfort in trusting in His salvation. Have you entered into a relationship with God like that? Do you have that kind of relationship with Him? Because if you don't, I, I would encourage you to begin that. 
to begin to respect him, begin to trust in his word, to, to learn more about Jesus Christ and to see how Jesus died for our sins so that we could be forgiven and to believe in him, to receive his salvation. It all starts with that fear, that respect for who God is. So if you've never, if you've never embarked on that, taken that step, and begun to fear and believe and trust, today could be the day for you to begin to enter into that relationship. Another step you could take today in response to Psalm 103 is to work at talking to yourself more. Right? We need to do that. Like David's modeled that for us. Don't let your mind run away with you. Don't let your mind control your emotions and control your life and how you respond to people and circumstances. Take control of that. We talk, sometimes we use the word meditate. It's a biblical term. It comes from Psalm 1. Meditate. Focus your mind on God's truth. Think about it. Let it fill your mind and heart. That's what we've done today, right, in the time that we've had walking through this psalm. We've gone through and we've thought about God's love and it pushes out those self-absorbed thoughts and gets, us, gets our focus in the right place. So work at talking to yourself more. Maybe that's a commitment you need to make this week. Right? To have some time, focused time where you focus your mind on, on the Lord, where you pray, where you read His Word. Right? That's the, those are the practical steps to do this. Maybe specifically, meditate more on Psalm 103. Right? It's such a great psalm that celebrates God's character and His love. Or maybe, maybe there's someone you need to share this psalm with. Someone you know that, that needs this encouragement. Maybe there's somebody who's just, who really is caught up in, in, in thinking about themselves and discouraged. And you could share this, this word with them. And encourage them to, to look up, right? To look out from themselves. And to begin to, to bless God, to worship Him, to praise Him for who He is. Pray that God will make us to be those kinds of people who, who go throughout the day, who go throughout our lives filled with a sense of the love of God. 